Good morning. Welcome to worship. At this time, please silence any devices that make any interruptions during the worship service that let us focus reverently on worshiping God this morning. Please rise and join us in singing our welcome hymn, O Come All Ye Faithful.
each other in the name of Jesus Christ and pass the peace and love he offers. Good morning. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. It is still Christmas, despite what the culture around us says. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Glad to see you. On the Sunday after Christmas, I'm always glad to see anybody. <laughs> and here you are ready to worship God together. After the service today, you will have the chance, if you would like it, to talk back to me. And you seem like talk-backy people. So uh, over in Fellowship Hall, by the way, is right over there. After the service, go over and enjoy some beverages and refreshments. And after a few minutes of that, I will go over, and if you would like to, you'll have the chance to respond to the things that I will say. I'll be answering your questions that you have submitted this morning, and I may say something that you'd like to follow up on, something that you might not agree with, or maybe you do agree with it, or maybe you're not sure and you'd like further clarification. So please join us. I have a correction for the bulletin. Imagine that. <laughs> and this is my fault. There is an announcement about the upcoming Marsolier family concert. And it says family concert and dinner. There's no dinner. <laughs> so it's the family concert and fast. <laughs> the the fasting will be at your own discretion. The concert is at 6.30 that evening, and it will be correct in the Oasis, God willing. <laughs> there is also a notice in the bulletin about an official notice about the meeting of the members on the 26th of January immediately following worship. There are other announcements, of course. Please pay attention to them. And if you are new among us, please know how welcome you would be at anything that you see there. Don't think you need a special invitation or that it's only for the insiders. Everyone is welcome at everything. So please come. With all of that in our hearts and minds, we do turn together to worship God.
morning. Please join me in reading the call to worship in your bulletin. Praise God. Praise God in the heavens. Praise God in the heights. Praise, Praise God, God, sun and moon. And moon. Praise, Praise God, all you shining stars. Young men and women alike, old and young together. Let, Let them praise the name of the Lord, for God's name is exalted. Please join me in the prayer of invocation. Light, Light of, of life, life, you came, came in flesh, flesh born into human, human pain and joy, and gave us power to be your children. Grant, grant us faith, O Christ, Christ, to see your presence among us, us so that all of creation may sing new songs of gladness and walk in the ways of peace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The Lord be with you. I invite you to speak aloud or in the quiet of your own heart the names of those who are particularly on your mind this morning. Let us pray, beginning in silence. <coughs> we are in such awe, O oh God, 
that you have come as one of us, that you share the life that we share, that you would know exactly the joys and sorrows, the burdens of life as we know it, and that you would overcome all of it on our behalf. We are in awe of the meaning of this season. We are particularly in awe of the way you went about it. In a baby, in a far off little place, you have confounded all the human wisdom, all the standard operating procedures, all the religious expectations in order to change everything. We are in awe. We are particularly in awe that you have chosen us to be your children, to be today's arms and legs and feet of Jesus in the world. Sometimes we can see his footsteps in front of us clearly and can follow them without thinking. But often they're not quite so clear and it requires some real concentration on our part to figure out what he's up to and where we should be. Give us grace on that journey together. Give us patience with each other, joy in the journey, and the satisfaction of knowing that even when we cannot see the end of the road, we are doing our part along the way. We lift up before you those that we have mentioned out loud and those that have been treasured in our hearts. Whatever it is that we might have to add to the healing that you are doing, we offer it. Send us. Give us those moments in our daily life when we encounter people who have a need we don't even know about, but can meet. We thank you for the folks who came here Christmas Eve, for the folks who are here today, for the folks who are yet to come. Every one of us has something we need and every one of us has something to give. And we're grateful for this opportunity. We pray for the homeless, for the lost. We pray for our government. We pray for leaders everywhere. And we pray for this church family as it moves into its next season of anticipation and faithfulness. In all things and in all ways, we would be your people. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, who said, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
on this last Sunday of the calendar year, we look back over the previous 52 weeks and we are amazed. What changes, some not welcome, have come over us. Through it all, God's, God's abiding presence has shown the way step by step. We are blessed. Let us worship God with our tithes and offerings.
Please join me in prayer from your bulletin. As Joseph faced a challenge and offered himself, so we now renew our commitment to care, share, serve, and love others. May it be so. Today's Gospel reading, Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23, is found on page 682 in the Pew Bibles. This is a difficult reading to endure. It is humbling to realize that our faith begins with Jesus and his family as refugees from danger. Like so many in the world today, we aren't sure how long they were in Egypt but it was for a long time. For those who think the Christmas story is all beauty, the horrific violence of Herod is an eye-opener. Receive these words now and listen for God's word for us. After the wise men had gone, an angel from the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up, hurry, and take the child and his mother to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is looking for the child and wants to kill him. That night, Joseph got up and took his wife and child to Egypt, where they stayed until Herod died. So the Lord's promise came true, just as the prophet had said, I called my son out of Egypt. When Herod found out that the wise men from the east had tricked him, he was very angry. He gave orders for his men to kill all the boys who lived in or near Bethlehem and were two years old and younger. This was based on what he had learned from the wise men. So the Lord's promise came true, just as the prophet Jeremiah had said. In Ramah, a voice was heard crying and weeping loudly. Rachel was mourning for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were dead. After King Herod died, an angel from the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph while he was still in Egypt. The angel said, get up and take this child and his mother back to Israel. The people who wanted to kill him are now dead. 
Joseph got up and left with them for Israel. But when he heard that Herod's son, Archelaus, was now ruler of Judea, he was afraid to go there. Then in a dream, he was told to go to Galilee, and they went to live there in the town of Nazareth. So the Lord's promise came true, just as the prophet had said. He will be called a Nazarene. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Not always, but in this moment, we thank you for our questioning minds and hearts. Be with us, speak to us, by the power of your spirit. Amen. What a scripture lesson, right? Uh, on the one hand, I'm thankful I'm not preaching on it, but it's violence just is so stark. And I don't know if you caught the reference to the, the prophecy about uh, the woman in Ramah who would be crying for her children. That is part of the Palestinian territory today. It's just, the whole thing is just mind-boggling. Uh, so thank you for reading that. I would also like to say thanks as I begin for the people who worked all during Advent and Christmas Eve to put things together in such a wonderful way, and especially the choir. And here they are again. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. So I asked for your questions during Advent, and I will be responding to them, and then invite your response to my responses <laughs> after the service. I don't believe that questioning and doubting are the opposite of faith. The opposite of faith is fear in my mind. Questions, doubts, struggles, they actually light the way to faithfulness in my mind. So I love questions and doubts. Here's one, somebody wants to know, when did you first know you wanted to be an ordained minister? And how did you know that? I have no clue. <laughs> Seriously, I don't. I don't know when that dawned on me. I do remember at the age of seven, we had a dress up as what you want to be day at school. And I threw a white shirt on backwards and put on a gray sweater. Uh, and a black hat, that was my image, and went dressed that way, much to the astonishment and chagrin, I think, of my dad. So I really don't know. How did, and how did I know uh, as I grew that that was the way? Mostly by the doors that opened and the ones that closed, which is typically how I decide what it is that God is wanting me to do. And my prayer always is, if I'm not supposed to do that, slam it really hard because <laughs> I don't do subtlety sometimes. And, and if you just quietly close it, I'll try to push it open again. So I tried other things in college. I tried uh, pre-law, I tried pre-medicine, and nothing fit. And uh, it was ministry that, that fit. So that's my best answer to that one. It's not a very august one, but there it is. And I'm grateful for the life that I've had. It's worked really well for me. Someone wants to know, I am from another denomination. What is the pastor search process like in the UCC, in the United Church of Christ? Chaos. <laughs> But a beautiful chaos. It's a, it's a very open market type system. Uh, there are no bishops to assign people here or there. So pastors who wish to make a move put their names up for grabs and churches that are looking for pastors 
put their names up for grabs, and it's a little bit like online date matching. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, the attempt is made to match what churches are looking for with the skills that particular pastors have. There are three stages to the process. The first one is what I just, I call breathing. And that's what we've been doing this fall. When a pastor leaves, and particularly when a pastor has died, there's a time when people just need to breathe and stabilize and keep things going and just let things settle in a little bit before pushing on. The second stage is the preparation of a profile of the church, and that's about to get underway. A team has been put in place to do that, and they'll be working for however long it takes them to write this description of who Desert Garden Church is. They will write it lovingly and positively and honestly so that in this dating thing that will go on, a prospective pastor can read that and get a real sense of who this people is and who they think God is calling them to be. So that's the second stage. And the third stage is the actual search. Another team will be put in place to conduct interviews and do background checks and all of that and eventually to nominate to you one candidate, their choice. That person will come and meet you probably on a weekend. There will, will be a series of events uh, and that person will preach on a Sunday morning and then the congregation will meet to vote whether or not to extend a call to that person. So again, nobody assigns anybody anywhere and you are the ones who will make that decision. It's an open process. You'll be having the support of the Southwest Conference at every step along the way. I'm not allowed to be an active part of that process because I could have undue influence. Not that I would ever do such a thing. But I can be a resource in the writing of the profile uh, and, I, and I will be there in the background all along the way until a new pastor is selected. So thank you for that question. Someone asked this. In praying, we seem to ask for specific solutions at which we have already arrived and for the ability to help other people as we have already decided they need to be helped. Why are you laughing? In other words, we want God to do it our way rather than seeking to do things God's way. Do you find religion is mostly trying to control God in order to have things our own way? What a great question. The short answer is yes. Partly, yes. Uh, that's our tendency. We want things to be our way because our way is the way we want it. How's that for deep theology? And we will try to impose that on God and, and flatter God and convince God that our way really is the way to do it. So yes, we do that. And it's not all bad. I think God wants to know what we think and want and what's in, of course, God already knows that, but uh, it's helpful for us to voice that, I think, especially to each other so that it's out there. But hopefully we also include in our praying and in our thinking the prayer that Jesus prayed, not my will be done, but your will be done. Jesus also tried to tell, take this cup away from me. This, that's what he wanted. And he, was, he prayed it that way, but was open to whatever it was that God wanted from him. So we are constantly being formed, and we don't always like it. The Holy Spirit is always leading us and changing us. The change is difficult in case you hadn't noticed that. 
So thank you for that profound question. And yes, indeed, much of what we call religion may in fact be a way to try to control God. Someone asked this, you appear to be enjoying yourself as our interim pastor. <laughs> really? <laughs> what do you enjoy most in ministry here and what do you enjoy least? Kind of a personal question, don't you? <laughs> what do I enjoy most? Nearly every aspect of it. And that's true, I am enjoying my time here. I love meeting new people. I love uh, learning new languages, and every church has its own language. I love learning new cultures, and every church has its own culture, for lack of a better word. That's one of the things I love about traveling. And coming into a new congregation is a bit like traveling to a new place. I like preparing for worship and worship itself. I like working with and developing the organization. You name it, I pretty much enjoy it. What do I enjoy the least? How about we change that to what do I find the most challenging? Really, really, really long meetings. <laughs> and unhooking from ministry in a healthy way to take days off, uh, to recharge, to, re to have a Sabbath. Clergy are awful at that. And I happen to be a boundaries awareness teacher for the conference, so I'd better be decent at it. And I try to be, but it is a challenge because there's so much happening and there's so much that needs to happen and I enjoy it so much. So thank you for that question. What would you say to someone who says, I am spiritual but not religious, so I don't need a church? I would say you must be Methodist. <laughs> no, that's unfair. That's, that's unfair. Uh, I wouldn't say that at all. I would want to have a really great conversation with that. And I hear that a lot. We all hear that a lot. I want to know what is meant by that statement. If what is meant is, I don't want to get bogged down in all the human ideas and, and the human slogging of religion in the sense of the arguments and the budgets and all the day-to-day the -day stuff. I don't want to get bogged down there. I want to focus on God and on growing my connection with God and deepening the awareness of that, I would say, hmm, yes, I agree. And you'll probably like the United Church of Christ because it is sort of chaotic and it's, it's non-credal and uh, it, it seems to be free to cast aside things it no longer wants to be burdened with. But Sometimes to say, I am spiritual but not religious can mean I want to live in my own private little spiritual bubble and I want to have things just the way I want them and don't bother me <clears throat> with these other things with which I might not agree or I might find difficult. Well, in that case, I would want to offer a witness that as I see it, you can't follow Jesus by yourself. You can do some things by yourself, and you need to do some things by yourself. But ultimately, we need each other to follow Jesus, to discern where Jesus is going and where we should go after him. And anyone who has been in crisis and has had the arms of a community like this wrapped around them with love and care, knows 
that you just cannot get that on your own solitary spiritual journey. It's just not there. So it's a great question, it's a great topic, and in our culture these days, there's a lot of suspicion about organized religion, which of course is a crazy oxymoron. <laughs> it takes a minute, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but I do understand. So that would be my response. I'd be interested in hearing yours later. Someone asks this. I have seen us as a church shy away from hot topics, controversial items we would rather not address to keep things calm. Why do you think this is? Well, in part, it's the human condition. All of us have enough trauma going on in life enough challenges and busyness and things that we don't care for that we love to have places where that isn't the case. And that can be a function of worship and coming together. But I also think there's a special layer here at Desert Garden in that regard. You've been through a lot of trauma together. And that came out in the cottage meetings. You'll, I'll re be reporting on that shortly. But one of the things that came out is, is healing that, that is ongoing from what one meeting described as the big awful. Just trauma. And in the aftermath of things that have really gone the way we didn't want them to go, and we don't really understand why it all happened that way. In the aftermath of that, spirits are bruised, and it's a normal thing to want to stay away from any further bruising. Now, at least half of the church as it now exists has come into the life of the congregation quite recently. And so some of this doesn't make sense to you because you haven't experienced all of that. And I'm with you, I'm in that same boat. I do feel, I do know that as healing occurs, some of that dynamic will change and folks will feel more confident and comfortable with each other in being real and discussing, again, lovingly but honestly, what it is that we think God is wanting from us. We will find a new way forward, better than before. New energy will be unleashed and new faithfulness will be born. So again, thank you for that very profound question. Uh, and I happen to like hot topics. And I love hearing from people whose opinion about a hot topic is not my opinion. I really like that. <laughs> oh my goodness, look at that. All right, I'm not going to get through everything here. I'll pick one more. What is the biggest selling point of our church for a new pastor? <clears throat> Someone wants to know. Well, you have many of them. You're fabulous people. No reaction to that? <laughs> it's a full-time position, and those are disappearing rapidly. Churches like this are disappearing, so that's a real plus. You have great leadership. The music ministry is superb. The facilities are superb and in tip-top shape. You are truly open and welcoming to a wide spectrum of people. <clears throat> and if the cottage meetings can be believed, you would like that spectrum to go even further. You are flexible. 
you are more flexible than I thought you would be, frankly, willing to try something new and see how it works. There is a lot to commend you to a new pastor, and those are some of the things that will draw some good attention to you. Well, thank you for your questions. The question box will go back out during Lent, and we'll have another go at this after Easter. So have at it when it comes back out again. And again, let me just say that I think our questions, our, our doubts, the things we work on are exactly the things that light the pathway to greater faithfulness. So bring them on. Amen. Onward. To him who is able to do more than we could ever think or ask or imagine, be glory and honor and blessing and power, and may he live in our words, in our deeds, in our intentions. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>